What's going on, Big Dogs? Welcome back to the channel. It's your boy Nick here with Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Football. We're going to continue down the team outlook path. We're in the NFC West. We've done the Cardinals. We've done the Rams. We're going to move to Seattle. Starbucks City. Relatively low-key offseason in Seattle, except for the addition of Fat Boy Lacey. But I'll get into all that in a second. Remember, if you like the vid, make sure you give it that thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you are new. We'll be doing team outlooks for all 32 teams. If you're looking for a specific player, go to my channel, type in the team that the player's on in the search box, and there will be an outlook for that player within that video. It's that simple. So let's get cracking. So, Russell Wilson at quarterback. Technically speaking, the worst year of his five-year career, fantasy football-wise. But to me, the story here is clear. It's clear as vodka. His mechanics didn't break down. He didn't look like a bad quarterback. The week three MCL sprain he suffered put a damper on his year and really messed things up for him. Especially coming off that 2015 season where he finished his quarterback four in fantasy. Huge expectations in 2016. So I want to break down his rushing game and, and kind of show you how much of that MCL sprain really played into the numbers that he put up. And I have some stats here I want to read off to you. Wilson has yet to finish a season with less than 489 rushing yards or under 5.2 yards per carry prior to last year. He did both of those last year. 259 rushing yards and 3.6 yards per carry. So from... from Weeks 3 to 11, that's when the injury really uh, hampered him because he had the injury in week 3, which is 8 games. He averaged 3.75 rushes per game, 6.1 rushing yards per game, and 1.63 yards per carry. So you know, when you look at the 8 games outside of that stretch, before and after, it's a fair playing field because they're both 8 games. He was averaging 5.25 rushes a game, so an increase of about a rush and a half per game. 26 rushing yards per game, so 20 more rushing yards per game. And his yards per carry went from 1.6 to 5.0. So back to his standard rushing level of play for Russell Wilson. The injury really killed him in that sense. Obviously, Wilson's rushing ability is what makes him such a big fantasy asset. Not just the rushing numbers he puts up and the stats he puts up, but of course, like him being on Sports Center top 10 weekly because of because of a sack he evades or. Uh, you know, he gets away from a linebacker just to chuck it deep to Doug Baldwin or something like that. All these big plays factor into not only his rushing statistics, but his passing yards too. So this is this is why I love Wilson this year. So despite the, MCA, the MCL sprain, despite a terrible offensive line, and despite not having a second outside weapon behind Doug Baldwin, Tyler Lockett was hurt and they didn't have Jermaine Curse is the definition of just a guy. They didn't have a second we weapon, and Wilson finished the season as quarterback fantasy 11. Quarterback fantasy, wow, I just said that backwards, didn't I? Fantasy quarterback 11, if so facto, I'm your boss. Now when I look at that, I say, juice up those rushing yards, which are 259, to his career average, which is right about 600 yards. He winds up as QB6. And I'm sure his passing numbers would have been better had he had, um, had he not had the MCL sprain. So, you know, there, I don't see any fall off in Wilson's game. When you look at the team as a whole, uh, his pass attempts and his passing yards have increased every single season in all five seasons coming into the NFL. Doesn't look like the trend is going to stop. They are, you know, ever since beast mode kind of went away, they know that they've had to transition into a passing offense. So I have a little chart here that I'll put on the screen. It's basically showing the percentage of their offensive plays year over year and the NFL rank. So passing wise, they were 32nd, 31st, 29th. And then last year they jumped up to 17th in the NFL and their percentages are getting higher and higher as you can see. Right now, Wilson's going off the board as QB5, 66 overall. So he's, he's right behind Drew Brees. He's about 10 spots ahead of Cam Newton. I think that's I think it's just about right. I would actually probably take Wilson over Drew Brees, but I think he'll finish as a top five fantasy quarterback this year. So if he falls to it's a great, it's a great pickup, and he probably will in a lot of leagues considering he had a down year last year. You know, it's a, it's a what what have you done for me lately kind of year. All right, so we move over to his weapons on the outside. And if you watch any of my videos thus far, you know I got this little man crush on Doug Baldwin this year. Basically, Baldwin's been a top 10 fantasy wide receiver in each of the past two seasons. In 2015, he scored 14 touchdowns, and everyone was like, oh, that number's going to drop. You know, he's going to fall off hard. And it did. He dropped from 14 to 7 and still finished as a top 10 fantasy wide receiver. He's one of the top route runners in the NFL. He doesn't get that exposure, and he doesn't get, you know, the glamour because he's a smaller receiver, right? So he's not that prototypical build but neither is Odell or Antonio Brown. They just happen to be very flashy. They're super explosive and they do a bunch of dancing and a lot of shit off the field, right? Doug Baldwin doesn't do that. He's a great route runner, great hands, just does everything well. And as I said, top 10 last two years. So again, you go back to that offense. They've been linearly increasing their pass attempts every single year since Wilson came to the league. 
and they have Wilson, who's one of the most efficient quarterbacks. So you have a great quarterback throwing you the ball in a team that's looking to pass the ball more. And in my opinion, Seattle does not have another outside weapon. I know they're getting Tyler Lockett back, but to me, he's nothing more than a, than a gadget, special teams, return, um, playmaker kind of guy. He's not going to be taking 110, 115 targets away from any receivers on the outside. So Baldwin, to me, is like the number one, number two, and number three option on the outside entering this year. And not only has Seattle's offense been passing the ball more, but Baldwin's target numbers have increased in each of the past five seasons as well. So let me read off this statistic for you from Pro Football Focus. Since week 10 of 2015, Baldwin ranks 17th among wide receivers and targets, but the only wide receiver he's behind in fantasy points is Antonio Brown. Let that sink in. It's a year and a half of games. He's only behind Antonio Brown. And as those targets increase, he's only going to put up bigger numbers. So it's crazy to me. Baldwin is going as wide receiver 13, number 25 overall, behind DeAndre Hopkins, behind Amari Cooper, behind Brandon Cooks. To me, he's my wide receiver nine this year, right behind T.Y. Hilton. And there's an argument to be made there, in my opinion. If I'm that first or second pick, I'm taking one of those top running backs, and then I'm getting probably two wide receivers on the back end. I'll take Doug Baldwin at 17 or 18, or I'll take him at 21, 22, 23 if he falls there. I'm totally okay reaching for Baldwin ahead of... ahead of Dez, Amari, DeAndre Hopkins, and Brandon Cooks. So to me, he's one of the best values at wide receiver in that early stage of um, in that early stage of guys. So to me, ball wins that only weapon. Obviously, they got to fill the depth chart. They have to have other wide receivers, which I mentioned. Tyler Lockett is their number two, but I'm not ready to call him anything more than that. No, that Tavon Austin, Percy Harvin type playmaker, big plays. Uh, you know, 600 receiving yards is cool, but not for where he was being drafted last year. He was going in like the seventh, sometimes a sixth, sixth to eighth round last year in drafts, which is absurd to me. This year, people have, have cooled off a lot on the guy. Uh, he's currently going wide receiver 57, 150th overall. I mean, obviously there's crazy value there in that given the upside and his talent, but I'm not, you know, I'm not really sure where he'll actually land in drafts. If he's there, that's fine. But He's a better real life player than a fantasy pick. He brings a dynamic to that offense that, you know, not a lot of players in the league can, but with that comes, you know, boomer bust games. He's gonna be a very kind of like a roller coaster ride kind of guy. Better in MFL 10s where you don't actually have to start the guys. Deeper leagues, definitely worth taking the shot on if he's going that late. I mean, in any leagues, he's worth that going that late, but I, I mean, I'd be surprised if Lockett proves me wrong and finishes as a wide receiver three, but I don't think that's gonna happen. So after Lockett and Baldwin, the depth chart begins to grow physically taller. You got Jermaine Curse, who's about 6'1", 210. He's been their wide receiver three consistently over the last couple of years. He was like wide receiver 67 last year, wide receiver 55 the year before that. He offers literally no upside, so I'm not touching him in any drafts. There is one guy I really do like though. His name's Paul Richardson. 6'1", about 185 pounds. Skinny dude, straw shaped, looking like this. Not orange though. Here's what I like about Paul Richardson. I mean, he's 25, first of all. The raw tools are there. Very talented, very athletic, leaping ability, catching ability, big play ability is there. That's something that this offense doesn't have in terms of like a, you know, a, like an AJ Green type of playmaker. You're not gonna see a lot of those plays, but he has that ability. And his finish to last season was, was really highlight filled. He played in 67% of their offensive snaps over the final four games of the season, including the playoffs. He caught 15 of 19 targets for 213 yards and two touchdowns in those four games. And he just, if you watch any of those games, if you remember any of the highlights, you could type in, go to Google, YouTube, Paul Richardson, 2016 playoffs, and there's tons of, not tons, but there's a few plays that you're like, holy shit, who is this guy? Really, really crazy plays he made. So he was a second round pick out of Colorado. Unfortunately, he tore his ACL in 2015, but it says that as a second round pick, you know, Seattle obviously liked the kid a lot. ESPN Seahawks reporter, Shield. Padia, I don't know how you say that, believes there's an absolute opportunity for wide receiver Paul Richardson to earn more snaps this season. I mean, like, probably the most irrelevant thing I could have ever said to you guys right now, but I guess it's worth worth noting, right? And then lastly, behind Baldwin, Lockett, Curse, and Richardson, you got this big, big white dude, Tanner McAvoy. Shout out you, Brandon Lacey. Shout out Bergen Catholic. Shout out Bergen County. Shout out New Jersey. He went to school about five minutes from me. You probably saw some highlight plays last year of him. Big, big dude. He's like 6'5", 6'6", 230 pounds. Caught a lot of big passes last year. I'm not sold on him being a great route runner or anything, but he's a big upside play in Dynasty. He actually uh, injured his toe this offseason, required surgery, so he's going to be in competition for a roster spot. But if he makes it, definitely someone keeping an eye on in Dynasty leagues. So 
I'd say their lack of weapons on the outside is kind of counterbalanced by Jimmy Graham as their tight end. How many times did you hear going into last season, no one has ever successfully returned from this injury? Blah, 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 blah. Jimmy Graham, torn patellar tendon. No one will ever come back. Okay. We proved everyone wrong last year when little Jimmy came back, played in all 18 games, including the playoffs, and he finished as fantasy tight end two, only behind Travis Kelsey. Safe to say, he successfully came back from the injury. So on an overall scale, um, you have to consider that the tight end position as a whole was in a big down year with Gronk, Eifert, Reed, all get all injured. Um, you know, Travis Kelsey finished as a number one tight end. In 2015, he would have finished as a number tight uh, as a number six tight end with the same numbers. So it was a little screw skewed. I wouldn't say Jimmy Graham's a top three option there, but he had a really good year uh, overall. When you look at consistency, though, you know he did not play that well. In the last 10 games of the season, he didn't go over 67 receiving yards once. And that's including playoffs as well. And it's kind of hard to pinpoint what really happened here. Uh, his target his target numbers went down towards the end of the year, but he still had great yards per reception, 14.2, which is the best of his career. And he actually performed worse as Russell Wilson got healthier and was able to move around more, which is interesting. Uh, I'm not really sure how to take that, to be honest. But I'd say all in all, Graham said he barely practiced last year. He barely got into anything off season. So he was going in there game to game, week over week, just completely raw, you know, not really getting prepped for the game properly physically. This year he'll have all off season. He'll be in the practices week to week, uh, which can only mean good things, obviously, preparing and having chemistry with Russell Wilson. So I like that uh, as an upside play. Right now he's tight end six off the board. And uh, I think that's right around where he should go. I'm still taking Gronk, Reed, Olsen, Kelsey, uh, probably Tyler Eifert as long as he's healthy ahead of Graham, but that's probably where he'll land. So now we gotta move over to this running game, which is just a shit fest over there. They basically have three guys that are unable to stay healthy. Eddie Lacy, Thomas Rawls, CJ Proceis. I've been doing this channel inconsistently for the last, uh, this summer, last summer, and like the summer before that. The last two summers I probably put out a combined total of like seven videos. But in those seven, I guarantee you, I talked about Eddie Lacy's fat ass like five out of seven videos and I was on point each year saying that his fatness would get in the way and I'm on record saying it again this year. So Lacey signs to Seattle, one year $5.5 million deal, which is actually a top 10, he's a top 10 paid running back uh, now with that, basically eliminates Rawls from the equation in terms of any kind of fantasy relevance, right? Now Lacey is, he's expected to get obviously all the early down work and we'll see how the goal line work is split up between him and Rawls. He'll probably get a majority of that given that he's fat. Right now he's going off the board at RB24, 67th overall. And I'll be completely honest, admittedly, it's pretty good value for someone who's supposed to be the starter in a good offense. Still not taking him though. Just out of, out of principality. So here's my thing. Here are my points that I laid out. Like I said, I was so far off of him entering 2016 because he was on this like P90X binge, right? He's gonna get P90X into shape, right? That's not how that shit works. Someone who knows about fitness, nutrition, that's not, that's not proper conditioning. It's not the proper way to get into shape. And I knew that that was gonna affect him going in and that's exactly what happened. So I know the case that people are gonna make this off season. People act like he was incredible last year before going down with that ankle injury, which occurred because he's fat. It wasn't great. He, he, I understand he averaged 5.1 yards per carry in a five game sample size. You understand how small a five game sample size is? All right, 5.1 yards per carry. He was averaging 77 total yards a game and didn't score a single time for the Packers. Pretty damn good offense, right? 77 total yards a game. Didn't score a single time. I understand the 5.1 yards per carry. You don't remember Felix Jones? Remember that one season he had where he was like 5.8 yards a carry, became a starter in Dallas and like got 17 felon? It, it doesn't matter, but small sample size, I'm good. He was not good last year, so don't let people sway you with that 5.1 yards per carry. And let's, let's get to this point. Eddie Lacy is fat. He came into the league weighing around 230 pounds. He ran between 240 and 245 last year. This offseason, he tipped the scales at 267 pounds. Woo! Good for you. I'm actually kind of jealous. He probably went to like Chick-fil-A, Mickey Doys, Krispy Kremes. So Seattle had to put weight clauses in his contract, literally for him to lose weight as the months go by in the offseason. He's moving from a Green Bay Packers line, which was a good run blocking line, to Seattle's, which is the 26th ranked run blocking line in the league. When you're running behind a line like Seattle, you either have to be one of two things. You have to be a Marshawn Lynch type where you could run through guys and make guys miss tackles, 
or you got to be like a Shady McCoy where you're so elusive that guys can't really touch you in the backfield. Eddie Lacy is neither of those. He's got a little wiggle and he's got some fatness to him, but he can't move like Beast Mode or Shady. Now, for what it's worth, Lacy hit his two, his first two weight goals. Admittedly, Lacy hit his weight goals so far. He's under 250. He needs to get to 245 by the time the season starts. I doubt he'll have any problems doing that, but I swear it wouldn't surprise me if he just comes in overweight again and gets hurt because of it, because of his conditioning. So while Rawls is basically undraftable at this point, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw him take over that early down role. Probably not because Lacey sits, but because Lacey misses time, you know, and I, I think Rawls will be pretty prevalent in at least like two to three games this year. You know, rumors have Rawls at OTAs just flying around the field. He's supposed, supposedly in really good shape. Remember, he was a good player before getting injured, but that's been his problem. He can't get injured. He can't stay healthy. So it's possible that this position battle actually turns into a real thing at camp, you know, Rawls versus Lacey. I don't think they're just going to hand it to Lacey. I mean, what, what's... What good does that do for a team? You're in the NFL. You don't saying his dad coaching the team. Rawls right now is going as RB52, 156 overall. So, you know, I almost I prefer taking Rawls 100 picks later than Lacey on a value play. And then last but not least, obviously, you got to look at CJ Procise, the third down pass catcher there in Seattle. You know, I don't think the Lacey addition hurts Procise at all. I think it's more of a Rawls thing. 6'1", 220. Good size. Uh, I don't think he was ever really meant to play that three down role, the feature back role, and they found a really good spot for him as the pass catcher there. We only have a really, really limited uh, sample size of him though. He only played in six games last year, which is his rookie season. He still ended up finishing with more receiving yards, 208, than Rawls and Alex Collins, their other rookie back combined. But I mean, again, these three backs all deal with injuries. Procise, he had a hamstring injury last preseason, a hand injury early in the regular season, and then the shoulder, which cost him from week 12 on to the, to the rest of the season, right? If he can stay healthy, he's gonna be a really, a, a nice PPR back. He's getting picked at running back 39, which I'm not sure I'm, I'm ready to jump that high considering guys like LeGarrette Blunt are going after him. So is Mike Gillisley, which is just ridiculous right now. But, you know, he's a good PPR. He's a good PPR play. ESPN Seahawks reporter, here she goes again. Sheila Kapadia, she might, she better know her shit because I keep quoting her. Wrote, 60, recep 60 receptions is not a stretch for Procise if he stays healthy, obviously. But last year, the, the entire backfield combined for 75 receptions. So if he were to get 60, that's 80%. And I think that's, that's a little bit of a stretch. As I said, they got three backs, can't stay healthy. No way it's going to turn into a workhorse or a featured back situation here. I'm probably staying away from this entire backfield right now, what their costs are. If you're in a league that hates Lacey and he drops to the seventh, eighth round, it's good value. Rawls is going basically undrafted in 10 team leagues. I don't really love anyone in the backfield. So that's that. So answer me this. If you could have one of them at their current ADPs, Lacey running back 24, Pro Size running back 39, and Rawls like 52, who would you take out of the three? Who do you want as a value play? Not straight up, obviously. And give me an over under on Tyler Lockett. Does he finish inside the top 36 wide receivers, which is wide receiver three in 12 team leagues? Answer me those two questions. And that's gonna wrap up the video. I hope you enjoyed. Give it that thumbs up button if you did, if you found it informational. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. We'll be doing Team Alex for every single team, which means every single player. Player, player. And uh, share with your friends, you know. Hit the blog, subscribe to the blog. All these are in blog form as well on the website. Follow me on Twitter, all that good stuff. So I'll see y'all next time.